which attempted to compel the chief law enforcement officer of each locality within a state to basically conduct background checks. In other words, the Congress was saying, state sheriffs of the county, of Powell County, you're going to be our instrument to conduct this. Now, Virginia was only doing this, so we were exempt, so there was no possibility of a lawsuit. There were about 20-some states who didn't have background checks. Montana was one of them. They went and they sued, and under the 10th Amendment, the Supreme Court said, you can't compel Montana to do this. There is no authority to make the state a mere instrumentality of the federal government. I perhaps should have done this other case. But this one was from 1992 in New York. And this was an attempt by Congress to compel the states to handle, to take care of all the nuclear waste, including some military waste from, uh, from naval, uh, naval ships, to handle and dispose of all the nuclear waste. New York sued and won because the Supreme Court said you can't make a state a mere instrumentality. Why? Because the state is sovereign. It's sovereign at a different level, but it's an equal, equal sovereignty. Okay? So they, so they can't do that. Didn't have the power to do that. The General Welfare Clause, and I went and read, read this recently. This is the, my printed out version of the Elliott's debates. And I used the phrase general welfare and pulled everything out that related to that in the debates that took place about 30 miles from here in 1788. Remember, uh, the, the delegates to the convention, one of whom was Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, he did not sign the, the document that came out of Philadelphia. But by the time he came back to Richmond, he was agreeing upon it. The main holdup, I believe, at the time was the general welfare clause. And George Mason made a big deal of the general welfare phrase in there. And there was, there's a debate that you can see right in here. Edmund Randolph and a fellow named Nichols pointed out, well, the term general welfare is tied to the taxing power. The taxing power is tied to direct enumerated objects in Article 1, Section 8. Those are the only legitimate objects for which you can exercise a tax. The general welfare being the ability to affect that. It was not a general grant of power. Otherwise, again, the enumeration of the specific powers would have been useless and absurd to quote Hamilton. And in, in here, this is Mason, he said, but I wish a clause in the Constitution with respect to all powers which are not granted, that they are retained by the states. Otherwise, the power provided for general welfare may be perverted to its destruction. This became the 10th Amendment. Okay, and there were several states which after the uh, ratification convention, I'm sorry, the uh, federal convention in, in Philadelphia, said during their ratification conventions, we need some additional amendments to this document. So even as intelligent and as patriotic and as experienced as the uh, participants in the federal convention were, they missed the Bill of Rights. How did they find out? They went back to the people's representatives, and these questions were brought up, and they acceded to that, all of them. The Supreme Court, everybody looks at that as the final arbiter. That was maybe not the original intent, but anyway, we're just dealing with that right now. But even the Supreme Court has never held that there's an unlimited grant of power given to Congress to use the Interstate Commerce Clause. There's only three, three places that you can find this power. The Supremacy Clause, Interstate Commerce, or the General Welfare. I don't the General Welfare. This, and again, I want you to doubt me. This is requiring individuals to obtain uh, health insurance, a constitutional analysis, July 24, 2009. This is from the Congressional Research Service. Now, these are the people who work for the members of Congress. They are their subordinates. They're hired and fired by them. They have no tenure at all. Okay? Despite the breadth of powers that have been exercised under the Commerce Clause, it is unclear whether that clause would provide a solid constitutional foundation for legislation containing a requirement to have health insurance. Whether such a requirement would be constitutional under the Commerce Clause is perhaps the most challenging question posed by such a proposal, as it is a novel issue. What does the word novel mean? No. Well, wait, we've been around 220 years. What do you conclude from that? never been done before. Now, if the legislative intent in here, you can't find it. If the legislative intent in the ratification, you can't find it. In fact, what's being proposed by this by these species of mandates is a constitutional amendment without the benefit of two-thirds of the House and Senate voting on it, debating on it, the media talking about it, or three-fourths of the state legislature ratifying it. <coughs> this mandate approach 
is a radical alteration in our system of government. It is, in fact, a defilement of our current system of government. And if the people are, are intimate enough to adopt it, that will be the rule. But I don't think a bunch of people know it, and some in Congress don't want you to think about this. Make no mistake about it. This is a radical alteration in our form of government. Twice more in here, if you want to send me an email, I'll, I'll send you this. They talk about Congress not doing this, never doing this. And even those uh, bizarre, even most radical interpretations of the Supreme Court in these interstate commerce cases, the legislator, I'm sorry, the, the lawyers that are hired by Congress says they've never done this. They've never authorized this use of the interstate commerce clause. Let's go here to the CBO. This is the uh, Congressional Budget Office, the memorandum. This was put out in August 1994. There was an attempt in 1994 for national health insurance. It's called Hillary Care. Now, treatment of this is, and there were mandates in there, budgetary treatment of an individual mandated by health insurance. <coughs> A mandate requiring all individuals to purchase health insurance would be an unprecedented form of federal action. But what does unprecedented mean? Never happened before. Okay. No precedent. Blank slate. Nothing. Denied. And yet. <laughs> the government has never required people to buy. Ne never. What does that mean? Did it ever happen? <coughs> no. Never. Brand new. Okay. Has never required people to buy any good or service as a condition of lawful residence in the United States. An individual mandate would have two functions that in combination would make it unique. First, it would impose a duty on individuals as members of society. Second, it would require people to purchase a specific service that would be heavily regulated by the federal government. The government would exercise a much greater degree of control over the purchases required by an individual mandate than it does over any transaction in other federally regulated markets, simply because individuals could not pass up buying health insurance from qualified uh, private health plans enrolled in a government program. The difference in the degree of federal control would make the purchases of private health insurance predominantly public transactions. Well, where are you supposed to record public transactions? In the budget. Is that being done in Congress? No, it's not being done in the budget. Why? Because Mr. Obama doesn't want to tell you the real cost of these programs. He wants to hide the real cost. Because the transactions would be predominantly public, this is the CBO, not Rob Marshall, they would belong to the budget, even though individuals and private firms, not federal agencies, or their practical equivalent, would, would conduct them. An individual mandate of this kind would transform the purchase of health insurance from an essentially voluntary transaction into a compulsory activity mandated by federal law. Failure to record the cost of this compulsory activity in the budget would open the door to a mandate issuing government taking control of any resource allocation that would otherwise be left to the private sector. You want to buy a car? Any resource. You think you're covered? Yes, you are. Congress may tell you. You're going to buy a car every three years because we don't want these old cars in the road which are polluting the highways in these non-attainment areas doing this. This is a direct mandate on you to perform some kind of action. Okay, in the extreme, a command economy in which the President and Congress dictated how much individual and family spent on all goods and services could be instituted without any change in total federal receipts or outlays. Folks, do you have an insulation R value of R13 in your house? Not good enough, folks. We need to save the trees, okay? You can have R19. If you have to tear down the walls, tough. It's good for the economy. It'll make jobs. Don't we want to have jobs? You can see the endless degree of rationalizations that we go on here. Remember what Benjamin Franklin said. Man is a rational animal. can find a reason to do anything. Doesn't have to be connected to it. Doesn't have to be reasonable. Doesn't have to be right. But you can find a reason to do anything with this kind of thinking. The Supreme Court has never held that the absence of an activity constituted a form of economic activity sufficient to kick in the Interstate Commerce Clause to substantially affect it. To reason this